so let's get started. Um, well, first of all, um, I'd like to acknowledge that Embassy Culture House is centered in London, Ontario, which is on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Lenape, uh, the Ottawa Darren, and the Huron Wendat peoples at the forks of the Antler River. And this is um, land that is subject to the dish with one spoon wampum, as well as other treaties. Um, Jevons and I also are located in Vancouver, which is on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil people. Um, and I guess with this land acknowledgement, um, what I'm thinking about today is how this year, um, for the first time, I'm able to garden in, in the ground on and I'm growing medicine that was taught to me by my family for the first time and like what a gift that is. So, um, and as I'm thinking about that, I'm also thinking about um, all the land defenders of, across Turtle Island who are um, fighting resource extraction to, uh, against pipelines, against old growth forestry logging um, and the work that they're doing and how that's related to how I can be here. Um, so thanks for that. Um, we also have, um, yeah, and of the threads of places and that I'm thinking about today, we also have some people, collaborators who are joining us and supporting us from Hong Kong today, who are uh, fighting their own sovereignty issues, which will be, um, a part of, a large part of what we'll be talking about today. A um, little bit of housekeeping. Um, this talk is being recorded. Uh, we tried to keep the numbers for this um, gathering, online gathering, kind of low because uh, we're using this new soft, we're using Jitsi, which is, uh, we were unsure about how many people this platform could hold. Uh, so, uh, as Zoom, their servers, they go through China. We didn't want that for, for this particular talk. Um, and But unfortunately, yeah, we can't have that many people, so we're going to record it and try and share it later. Um, unfortunately, Jitsi is not closed captioned, um, so maybe that's something we can uh, work on later. Um, and I guess kind of the shape of what the next hour or two is going to look like is I'll give a little bit of introductions. Um, and um, our friend in Hong Kong, Brian, is going to give us some updates on uh, the situation there. Um, uh, we'll have a Q&A with Jevons and talk about um, one of his films, Dialect. And then um, my literally my oldest friend, Emil Dirks, is going to help us to um, sort of um, take what we were talking about in Hong Kong and sort of uh, widen that lens to see how those conversations affect um, larger situations um, on a transnational scale. Um, and then we're going to open it up to Q&A. Uh, so, and then for Q&A, um, I'm sort of thinking like people can put questions in the chat and I will um, look at them and organize them and then be able to put them to Jevons and Emil. Um, but also hoping this will be kind of like a sort of informal casual thing. So maybe things will just kind of do something else, but that's kind of that's kind of where I'm going with this today. Um, <laughs> so yeah, um, let me see if there's any pressing questions in the chat right now. And looks like we're good. I'm gonna keep rambling into my camera. And yeah, so I guess first off, I'd like to say that the this event is being hosted by the Embassy Cultural House, uh, which was established in 1983 as a community community driven gallery that hosted inter interdiscipline sure. interdisciplinary programs. Um, and closed its physical doors in 1990. Um, and in 2020, 
the Embassy Cultural House was re-envisioned as a virtual artist run space and community website. Uh, so through Embassy Cultural House, um, um, we are presenting um, this program called Sleepwalking, which uh, my Cantonese is bad, but Mong uh, uh, Yao is uh, Cantonese for sleepwalking. And this is a series of screenings, talks, readings, exhibits, open calls, and events in solidarity with the people of Hong Kong who are fighting the 2019 extradition bill. So in China and in Hong Kong, sometimes it's hard to talk about political issues. So there's like ways that you speak about it indirectly. Um, and so, and also just there's a lot of wordplay. Uh, and so um, in Hong Kong to say I'm going sleepwalking um, is a way to say that you're gonna go protest. Um, so through this program, um, we're going to, we hope to highlight ongoing events in Hong Kong and connect them with artists, experiences and issues from our own communities as a means to build transnational solidarity. Um, so that's a bit about us. And then um, I'd like to introduce Jevons. So Jevons is born, raised and educated in Hong Kong. Jevons Ao studied filmmaking in, at the Hong Kong Academy for Performing Arts, School for Film and Television, uh, under the renowned critic Xu Kai. Um, after graduating in 2004, Ao freelanced for a while and made his own short films before entering um, the television network TVB. Uh, so Ao was one of the five directors asked to imagine what Hong Kong might look like a decade into the future with his critically acclaimed short film dialect uh, presented as part of 10 years in 2015. And this one, the, this one, the best film at the 35th Hong Kong Film Awards. Um, and, and his other film that he co-directed, Trevisa also won the um, Hong Kong Film Award the next year. And then they were both banned by China as well. <laughs> um, and then his last film, Distinction, is about children with special education needs. Um, and I also taught at Baptist University. So Jevons, feel free to hop in because this is just stuff that I found put and put together for you, but I hope it's correct. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Cool, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then Emil, besides being my oldest friend, as I mentioned, um, is a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto's Department of Political Science, where he explores the policing and detention of marginalized populations in contemporary China. Um, previously, Emil was research associate at the London School of Economics International Drug Policy Unit, and was also a visiting scholar at Yunnan University's School of Public Administration. Um, Emile's writing on domestic Chinese politics has appeared in numerous publications and his research on a police DNA sample collection program that targeted millions of men and boys across China served as the basis of a June 2020 New York Times investigative report. So he's done some pretty, anyway, he's pretty cool too. <laughs> um, so that's a bit about our main presenters today and I'm hoping to turn it to Brian now to give us a little um, update on um, how on the situation in Hong Kong at present, because it's a little bit hard to know what's happening on the ground all the way over here. So, um, Brian. Thank you, Stacy. Thanks. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Before the introduction, I apologize for hiding myself behind the camera because of the following sensitive reasons. So in June. 2020, China's National People's Congress Standing Committee passed the law of the Hong Kong People, uh, the People's Republic of China on safeguarding na national security in the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, or simply we call the National Security Law. The new law was not only effective on Hong Kong citizens, but also asserts jurisdiction over people who are not residents of Hong Kong as well as those who have ever been in Hong Kong. Two days after the law was passed, the Hong Kong government declared that a slogan, 
Liberate Hong Kong, Revolution of Our Times, implies Hong Kong independence, or separating Hong Kong from China, and thus was effectively forbade its use. Dozens of pro-democratic activists, including former legislators Ted Ho, Nathan Law, and Bajio Learn, have to leave Hong Kong after the national security law was in effect. Shortly after this, about 30 activists residing outside Hong Kong, including an American citizen, Samuel Chu, were wanted by the Hong Kong government and police force. On 11th of November, the Hong Kong government disqualified four democratically elected lawmakers. Foreign Affairs Minister of Canada, Minister Shambang, said Canada was deeply disappointed. Open quote, this decision further narrows Hong Kong's autonomy and the space for freedom of expression and public participation in governance in Hong Kong. This action clearly demonstrates a concerning disregard for Hong Kong's basic law and the high degree of autonomy promised for Hong Kong under the one country, two system frameworks, open quote. Close quote, sorry. Of course, the Hong Kong government ignored the statement and then introduce the requirement for the district councillors to take oath swearing to uphold the basic law and purge allegiance to the government. On 28th of February, Hong Kong police have charged 47 Democrats with conspiracy to commit subversion over legislative primary election held in last July. On 30th of March, China amends basic law annex to improve Hong Kong's electoral system and to ensure only patriots were administering Hong Kong in the future and gave permission to national security police to screen election candidates. Press freedom and independent media institutions are increasingly under threat in Hong Kong. On last year, 10th of August, Jimmy Lai, owner of the pro-democracy newspaper Apple Dairy, and four other personnel from the newspaper's management were arrested on suspicion of collusion with a foreign country or external elements to endanger national security, conspiracy to defraud, and other offenses. On 22nd of September, the police declared that only reporters of government registered media or internationally recognized and belonged foreign media would be recognized by the police as media representatives. This means that the police can arrest unrecognized news reporters. On 3rd of November, a TV program producer Yuk Ling Choi was arrested on suspicion of making false statements when carried out an in-depth investigation into the police mishandling of a mob attack in Yunnan West Wales station happened on 21st of July in 2019. Apart from all this, freedom of expression enjoyed by education professionals were severely limited. Education Bureau dr drastically changed the curriculum by censoring content contents related to human rights and democracy in school textbooks. Negative information about mainland China was removed and revised as a result. The Education Bureau also urged schools to reveal their library collections and remove books that may breach the new law. Following the enactment of national security law, more Hong Kong residents want to make their home in Canada. Capital flows out of Hong Kong banks reaching Canada rose to their highest level on record last year, with about 43.6 billion Canadian dollars in electronic funds transfers recorded by FinTech. Here are some more dynamics between China and Canada. On 27th of March, China Saxon's member of Parliament of Canada, Michael Chong, and members of the subcommittee, subcommittee on International Human Rights of the Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs and International Development of the House of Commons 
of Canada, which is known as the SDIR. The sessions come, came after subcommittee members declaring that there were evidences about Uyghur living in Xinjiang province were mistreated by the Chinese Communist Party. This mistreatment has constituted genocide as laid out in the Genocide Convention. Apart from conserv conservative Michael Chong, members of SDIL being censored include Kenny Chu, Liberals Peter Fonseca, Ikra Khalid, Jennifer O'Connell, and Anita Vanderbilt. Recently, Chinese government has also charging was also charging two Canadians, Michael Coffey and Michael Spurfer. They have been jailed in China since December 2018 in what is widely regarded as a retaliatory arrest. Taking place just days after the detention of Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou. So these were only the tip of the iceberg and its influence is growing rapidly. Maybe we should start reassessing this uprising totalitarianism today. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Brian. Um, yeah, um, that also reminds me of uh, the 10,000 Steps program that we'll be organizing as part of sleepwalking. Um, Olivia, Olivia, do you feel like you have Maybe you could give folks a little update on like some of the sleepwalking programs that we might be doing in the next while. Yeah, I'll jump in really quickly just to say that on May 27th, it will mark um, 900 days that Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig have both been imprisoned in Beijing. Um, so we will be um, programming an event in solidarity with them. Uh, both Michael uh, Kovrig and Michael Spavor walk 10,000 steps in their cell every day to um, to keep fit, uh, you know, to um, ascertain their mental state um, and to keep their spirits up. Um, and so we want to um, convince people to walk 10,000 steps one day, uh, be it on May 27th or another day, um, in solidarity with the both of them and more details will come on this soon but for now um yeah thank you brian and i'm looking forward to hearing um emil and jevons so cool thanks so much olivia um all right so um yeah just to introduce uh, jevons a little bit more um like i mentioned he's directed uh two other films trevisa and distinction but today we're going to focus on um, his short film, Dialect, which was a part of 10 years. Uh, so Dialect is a humanistic story of a Hong Kong taxi driver who struggles to work and maintain a relationship with his family while Mandarin increasingly regulates the world around him. So um, he can't use his GPS or he has trouble communicating with his son. Um, he loses customers and he watches one of his passengers lose her job all because uh, she can't speak Mandarin well. Um, so Cantonese, which is um, also known as Gongdonghua, is the most commonly spoken language in Hong Kong. Um, and it's kind of, it borrows terms from English and many other languages. Um, so on the mainland, the mainland government considers Cantonese a dialect, even though when Cantonese and Mandarin people, like you can't, if you, you can't understand, I can't understand Mandarin, even though I speak very bad Cantonese. Um, and same, same for Mandarin. They can't really understand Cantonese. Um, so Dialect was a part of 10 years, um, which was five short films that imagined Hong Kong uh, in 10 years from 2015. Um, so when it, I remember when it screened as part of the Vancouver International Film Festival, their 2016 program, the Vancouver Playhouse, which has seats maybe like six, 700 people was like completely sold out for two screenings. Like people were extremely uh, moved and interested to see this film. Um, it was packed at capacity. Um, 
And in Hong Kong, when uh, cinemas were too afraid to screen this film, uh, community groups and organizations hosted uh, 34 simultaneous guerrilla screenings of this film under bridges, outside town halls, outside the uh, legislative council. Um, and these screenings were attended by thousands. Um, so this film, I feel I, I have, I'm a bit separated from Hong Kong, but I feel like it is um, a very important uh, moment. Uh, it's very important to Hong Kong, very important to Hong Kong culture. And it's pretty special that we get to um, get a bit of Jevons time today. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so hi, Jevons. Thanks yeah, for spending hi. time with us. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah. yeah um, it's my honor, okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, truly, yeah. like it's, um, what, it was, I was just so excited that we got to, that somehow we got to talk to you today. <laughs> um, yeah, so maybe we have, I have a set list of questions here, and if um, some of the other, if Brian or Olivia or Emil, you want to jump in and talk to, feel, or please feel free to. Um, but um, yeah, maybe I'll just start with those. Um, so first off, in dialect, um, I would I was wondering how you came to focus on language as your topic of concern. Mm, for the very beginning, um, when when we are five directors, we come together thinking about. Um, we, we have the ideas that, okay, what happens wow. next uh, in Hong Kong at the time? So uh, each director will have to think about what's their subject concern. And we, we have to, to figure out if we have uh, any crash. So if I'm, I'm talking language and they are talking language, so this doesn't make sense, right? So we have to different topic. But why we, the reason why I figure out the, the language, I mean, the, the dialect is because um, Actually, that's when I when I I'm not looking at the future. What's happening next? I'm just looking at my past. What affects me most? And at that time, I found that actually language is the stuff that that affects me most during my brought up, because um before I mean because it's it's I think it's because of the Hong Kong history. Um, before 1997, Hong Kong is the British colony, and so at that time. English is very important in, in the city. And when I brought up and my parents will ask, um, can I, uh, is it better if I can go to the English medium school? And so uh, all my school subject is in taught in English and we have the class in English. And, and, but, but we, and after the 1997 and the city changed. And, and then because it's a, uh, under the Chinese, uh, under the China uh, uh, CCP, uh, the one country, two system, even though, but uh, Mandarin seems more and more important. And, and so after I work, and then I have to work, I'm, I have to speak in Mandarin. And I have the difficulties because uh, during, during in the past, um, uh, I, I haven't learned Mandarin a lot. And, and also in the past, uh, even though I am in the school, in the English medium school, but I'm not really, really good at English at that time. And I'm really, the, the, because the whole uh, atmosphere in the school, they are all speak in English. And I just feel that I don't understand what they are talking about. And, and then, even though in, you know, I'm not sure if you understand if, um, if you have to answer your question in English, um, in the in the exam, and actually you you, you are not really uh, answer it well for me because this is not my mother tongue language, right? And so this bothered me, and 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 we we are but at the same time we always think that Cantonese is a language. We always agree that um English is uh, Cantonese is a language, but I just feel that we are not really treat it as a language. We just treat it. It's an inferior, um, okay, better, you, you better have uh, English, you better have Mandarin, but we never, we never mentioned it. I mean, we, we are, we, you know, when I, when I was graduate in the, in the academy for performing arts, we have to pass the Mandarin test. Instead of, I have to pass the Cantonese <laughs> test, right? I have to pass my Mandarin test. So if I, if I failed in the Mandarin, 
then I can't I can't get my get my graduation. That's it's for me it's quite strange actually. And and so that uh after I work in the I work as a script writer at the very beginning as a filmmaker. I in the very beginning I start writing the I start writing in Cantonese. And so it's very good. Okay, I'm just feel okay, I very familiar. But due to the uh, co production uh, with the China, after, I mean, uh, especially I work with uh, another director, uh, Johnny To. Uh, he's a very famous director uh, in, in worldwide somehow. And he started working in China, his project. And so I have to write a story that included, like, uh, the character that is from mainland China or the story is happened in China. So that's the character have to speak in Mandarin. And I have the situation like that. I'm, I don't have confidence about what my character is saying is correct or not. I have to call, you know, I have to call my friends from China that is my, is that Mandarin makes sense to you? <laughs> I mean, I'm not really sure. So I'm losing my confidence because this is, it seems that, um, because this is not my mother, mother, mother tongue, and it it affects me. So I just this is my inner voice. I mean, that's my thought, and I don't know. Maybe, maybe I don't know how to share with the other people. Uh, so at the time, and we have the project the ten years, and so I'm trying to how about I I I, I express it in this way. So and see, is it what we are, uh, what was. What what's going on like that? So that's the language come 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 from. Cool. So yeah, really, it's coming from your own experiences um, yeah. in a way. And yeah, I can't help but like think of how, you know, Hong Kong is this place. It's really pulled by this the this history of like British colonization mm -hmm. and the English language, and then pulled by um, just pulled by like the mainland force as well by the Mandarin. And whereas like there's something very unique and or like the Cantonese that it's at, kind of at the core is like something that um it yeah it's just it's it's very distinct it's it's more than a dialect you know um, yeah yeah that's really cool also Johnny Toe when I saw that you were working with you made a movie that Johnny Toe produced I was like whoa <laughs> that's huge um so that's really yeah um, and yeah, I was just hoping f in terms of Cantonese, because um, it's such a, um, just to share with people here who don't really um, speak Cantonese, um, maybe just to share some examples, or Brian, maybe you could hop in on this too, of um, like idioms or uh, um, phrases or words that are in Cantonese that are uh, special for you or uh, hold personal or social significance for you. Like I remember I had to, I was making a film or I was making like a, I made an art video where I was just trying to translate all the yellow umbrella uh, protest slogans and trying to get my family to like work with me to translate them. And it was actually so hard because the Cantonese language, there's so much wordplay and it gets so complex that like everything that people, they were saying, it's all a joke. Like, like it's all these like four word jokes. So, um, yeah. Yeah, Brian? <laughs> yeah, Brian. <laughs> well, that's, um, I don't know, but I, I'm fascinated about the color words um, in Cantonese. So kind of like uh, if you describe yellow, you can have one gum gum. So, and uh, if it is white in color, you can say ba sai sai. So it's very typical Cantonese that um, it's very difficult to write as well. So and like- Difficult yeah. to speak, yeah. So like Wong, so is that like, uh, yellow gold gold, is that what it translates to? Wong gum gum. Mm, may it's not the same thing. Um, I think it refers to. Uh, so, I think it refers to describing the yellow on the object, mm -hmm. and 
and describing the texture as well. And uh, because Chinese is and, and Cantonese, it's like um, you you have a word, but it has um, at the same time um, uh, the sound and and depicts the picture and depicts um, the meaning within a word. So yeah. it's different from English uh, as like uh, in in the form of like phon phonetic or in the form of um, like a music. So Cantonese and, and Chinese, the word is, um, has, has different meaning, even with the same word in different contexts. So... Mm. And I think the most funny thing in Cantonese is the fourth language. <laughs> but uh, maybe we can have another session for this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mostly just know the all the swear words from like watching gangster films and stuff. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, we can get into that later. Um, okay, next question. Um, so um, I only got a chance to watch 10 years in Treviso, but um, I feel like Hong Kong life and culture uh, really shine through in both of those films. Um, so I just want to ask what makes Hong Kong so special um, and what will become of Hong Kong culture and Cantonese language as the Chinese government tightens its hold on the region? I think the, the I think it's, Hong Kong is the, the only place, I mean, before that is, I mean, right now it's still also, it's the only place that's uh, under one country, two system, right? Um, yeah, they, that's really, that's really, um, actually, this really unique. I mean, no matter the political and also the historical, before, oh, okay, before it's the British colony, and then right now it's the Chinese culture, so that's mixed, mixed a lot of, like, the Western and the, and the Oriental culture and and so the what the people i mean no matter their food and their arts and like the art film i mean this is a, a little bit different from what we can say and you can see from even though it's different from china it's different from british okay so it's the only unique one and um, and so um uh, yeah and but but at the same time, right now, because um, because the the China, I mean, the Hong Kong government is more uh, tends to be in China position. They 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 strengthen or they they actually they trying to uh, make the Hong Kong become a China only one of the Chinese city. So the the uniqueness will be declining because um. Not right now the people just like they they tend to they, they speak like they tend to have more people can speak Mandarin, they tend to be uh, have more Chinese culture and they actually they they eliminating or uh, a lot actually they already uh, eliminating a lot of the uh, the stuff that is uh, British colony, I mean left, so 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 that's that's the uniqueness and um, if this. Okay, if no more people uh, remember the, I mean, actually, all the street name. I mean, they now they still keep keep the street name, but actually, some of the uh, significant like the infrastructure already, like the uh, the Queen's Pier. We have the Queen's Pier in Hong Kong, and mm -hmm. um, uh, they 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 will change it. They 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 have no more here, and so uh, they just want to. I mean, if that's all all the all the inf uh, infrastructure, the building disappear. Especially, actually, con uh, construct con the, the building, the infrastructure actually have a lot of uh, symbolistic. Uh, I mean, the, the artistic sim symbol. I mean, but but right now, okay. After that, they may all left this the Chinese. Or they 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 will build. They will build a lot of um, huge stuff, but they they don't have any historic background, and so that's. This this will be the new Hong Kong, and so the new Hong Kong will be no more. They they, they will be always uh, easily be forgotten if this happen. I mean, I think I I have attend um a seminar before uh 
I mean, you see in, I remember you see in, I forgot which country, but the, one of the students that is from Spain, I remember, yeah, in Spain, uh, they, they asked, um, they asked me why, why it's so important to keep the Hong Kong, the Hong Kong culture. And I just tell, I just using an example to, to tell, tell him that um, if you, you are from Spain, so if you want to, if you come to Hong Kong, what do you think if, uh, do you think you can have the best Spanish food? You, you think where you can get the best Spanish food? Okay. So he, he will answer me, it's, of course it's, it's in Spain. So in Hong Kong, so we can provide the best Hong Kong food actually, probably. But if, 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 we, for, if, we, don't, if, we, if we don't need Hong Kong food, we change it in China food. We we have to all the people make China food, all the the other food. So, so where actually this is all all what you want. When you if you come to Hong Kong, I think you are expecting to taste the Hong Kong food, right? You don't expect to eat, to taste the Spanish food in Hong Kong, right? So so that's the the importance. But right now the the the, the changing right now you see the numerical the political change, especially the political change, it affects a lot, and so. Yeah, that's happened. Yeah, and like, I don't know, as someone whose parents come from Hong Kong, I can't help but think of like, the effect of having so many Hong Kong people, especially coming to Vancouver and like, hmm. w as this happens more and more with, um, with the political situation in Hong Kong, I'm just imagining what the effect of having Hong Kong people spread out all around the world is going to be. Um, cause, I don't know, I guess I just feel that through um just my history as well so um but yeah hong kong food also <laughs> um i don't know if you've had a chance to try hong kong food in vancouver and how it rates to uh how it compares to like uh food out in you can't eat out in the street here but um <laughs> Japanese, can i ask uh, how do you feel about dim sum in vancouver <laughs> i know i know you tried it uh, actually, it's really fantastic because uh, actually it's also maybe this is one of the um, character of the Vancouver because this is an immigrant city. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's also part, I can see part of the Hong Kong history here because uh, before the 1997, uh, actually there's the, the, the first wave of the immigrant from Hong Kong to Vancouver. And so there's a lot of bad, I mean, uh, best rest, uh, Hong Kong restaurants, uh, the, no matter the owner or the chef, they come to Vancouver to set up his business here. So it's really strange that when I come to here, I can taste the, 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 the food, I mean the Hong Kong food, I mean here, but not, right? Because in Hong Kong, it seems that it's a little bit difficult because more when I when I I, I I buy is is in Hong Kong. I think you you can say that you can see that there's there's a lot of like Sichuan, Sichuan, um, a lot of uh, uh Shanghai. The, the totally different uh, style. But but the the Hong Kong dim sum is um is not as many as uh, as in the past and not as good, not as that good as the past for my for my <laughs> for my opinion. So so it's really. But here I can see that okay, I can I can taste some because of the of the history uh, of the Hong Kong the people immigrants to 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 Canada and so that is yeah that's that's I can see parts of the, I can taste some parts of the, the good here and actually just like I can meet a lot of Hong Kong artists like um in the past uh, and Italy. And Italy, uh, he's a very famous t uh, TV act actress, uh, but he, but she immigrants from, uh, I mean, fifteen years. She she came to here for fifteen years, and and there's a lot of difference. Yeah, I I, I can meet all these uh, past uh, Hong Kong uh, famous entertainment entertainer. I mean, actors and actress here is very strange for me, <laughs> but in. In in Hong Kong, it's just like they they all they are changing to this is really different right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, like I mentioned, when Ten Years screened here, it was like so many people came to see it, and I think it's because of the enormous Hong Kong diaspora mm. that is in Vancouver for sure. Yeah, um, yeah. 
Um, I just want to be mindful of the time. So I just want to ask you maybe one more question um, and then um, we'll move on to a meal. And so I guess I'll ask, um, so I guess, hmm, let me take a look at my list of questions here. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll just mention again that you've directed two award-winning films uh, that were banned by the Chinese government. Or, and, I, and you already mentioned as well, like how you've come to Vancouver just in, because of uh, how ahead of the extradition bill you've come to Vancouver. And so already it's affected your tra trajectory. Um, so I'm just wondering further how, um, how, um, what's next for you and what, um, what your plans are and um, how, um, how what's going on in Vancouver is, mm -hmm. has affected you, I guess. Sorry, okay. how what's going on in Hong Kong has affected you. Yeah. Um, actually, for my first aspect is that, I mean, I can, I can describe more, I mean, I can describe more uh, like in when, when 10 years got the best film in the Hong Kong Film Award at that time, it's supposedly it's be a very good, good stuff, right? But the, the next day, I attend because the Teresa is the is the other day the, the opening is the, the opening the premiere is the other day after the film award. Uh, some of the actors and actresses will come to me and say say to me that uh, your your role will be very tough. Yeah, they um, be very challenging. They, they 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 after I got the award, they, 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 once you should get the best film award, but you, your role will be very challenging. The other the other people in the industry will think about that. And and of course, after that, um, uh, actually, if you mentioned my other film like uh, Distinction. Uh, actually, the contract is started before, before the premiere of 10 years. And so all my film actually already made is all before the 10 years screening, okay? Because, um, it's of course uh, it's very I, I have a lot of um, investor I mean uh, they will they will mention to me that um, you are very sensitive um, I'm not sure if I can really work with you and and this happened I mean uh, to me in Hong Kong but fortunately I'm I, I'm still can can make my stuff I mean I can have my own own work to do. And so, yeah, I'm still surviving. Um, and so, but you know that that that's limited limit limit my opportunities, uh, ex especially after after the success of the Trivisa. Uh, actually, a lot of even even Stephen Chow also approached me. But after, <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if you know Stephen Chow. Oh yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's a he's he's a he's a is a very um, support uh, success um, actors and also directors in Hong Kong as um, and and when I when I when before that he doesn't know when so because, because but that's why he he we, we have a meeting he, she, because he doesn't know what I what I have done he just know I was I work a film called Charisa and so we have a meeting after that and talk about the creative stuff and then and then. After, uh, I have to mention to him that actually I'm the one of the director of 10 years. Okay. And I have to know, I have to tell him that what, what this is about because he, he actually he's really not really know about it. He, <laughs> he, 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 and so, and so he, he, he said that mm, I'm not that political. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's, that's happened. I mean, that's, that's, that's my, I mean, I, I had a different cha challenging that the, a lot of people say that, okay, I can, uh, how about if you can help me to do the project, but do you mind you, you hidden your name? You don't mention that is your work. Yeah. So that's, you know, you know that you, you are so sensitive. Your mm -hmm. name is so sensitive. So actually distinction before that, at that time, uh, the, the, the distributor want to distribute the film, um, in China, definitely because it's not they uh, they think 
it's not that political. It's, it's just like the children's children film, and and the 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 chat the the Chinese distribution distribu distributor come come back. Actually, they agree. They agree. Actually, they okay. They 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 have to deal. They have accepted. But after that, they turn they turn it down because they tell the the the, the our distributors that um you know you 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 can't pass the you can't pass it. And uh, you know the reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And well, you've made some very strong choices, and that's going to take you in a very definite direction from now on, I guess. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And so and so after that, and and after uh, distinction, and um, and Brian mentioned um, a man, uh, Jimmy Lai, and uh, he approached me, <laughs> Jimmy Lai, and he. Because it's the next digital limit, uh, the, the Apple Daily, you know, the Hong Kong newspaper. Uh, he actually, at that time, he wanted to to set up a platform about the soft film platform, and 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 so he he asked if I can work with him, and because and I think that okay, that's good because I want to make something that without censorship, and 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 I need money and I need resources and I have to and you can back up with the money and resources I can make the contact for you. That's that's good, and so we work together, and but of course, uh, and it it worked for more than a year until until the February twenty twenty twenty, and and. No more money. I mean, the Apple Daily, you know, they have the difficulties in their financing, mm -hmm. and and Jimmy told me that uh, actually he 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 cried, <laughs> he cried in front of me, he tears, and yeah, because he think that this is his fault that he can't find the money for me, and mm -hmm. and so but he can't he can't keep it up, and so that's that's the journey, the stopping the I mean the platform journey have to come to an end, and then and then at that time. You see the Jimmy Light get arrested. You see, uh, all the, all my you know the Apple Daily the 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 high level C, uh, executive they actually they are my colleague <laughs> and we work together. And actually, my wife also think that if you are still in Hong Kong, you will also be get arrested too because you you also make some content that is quite sensitive, especially and um, um, under the Apple Daily we may we produce like free soft film. That's this um about the about the anti um that's about the fan song zhong hai me about the fan song zhong uh the anti an anti extradition bill yeah. movement extradition yeah, bill movement yeah yeah I actually at, yeah at that time we, we before that in the in the May of the twenty nineteen we we put uh we we released the the video at that time and mm -hmm. also we we have made something about the I put, I also produced some film about um the July fourth, uh, the June fourth. I mean about, mm -hmm. about the China, the China, and so my wife is really concerned about my my safe, especially after the national security law. So so that's why I come to here, and then yeah, and the actually and also I'm also involved in the movement as well. I'm one of the citizens that I'm involved and 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 there's there's a lot of trauma. I mean, and in 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 and in my in my mind, okay. And then so that's already affects me. I mean, um, and so when I come to here, and then uh, also I have to adapt a new life because the whole environment is totally difficult, and uh, and my status. I mean, my identity is is. Is so so strange right now for me, yeah. Because I'm asking myself, I'm always asking myself, am I still a Hong Kong people? Uh, who am I? I mean, who is? Um, I'm just like. Uh, it seems that I'm still a Hong Kong people, but it seems that the the people in Hong Kong think that I'm no longer Hong Kong Hong Kong people because okay, you you leave Hong Kong already. You are still you settle somewhere else, but in Canada. I'm no longer. I'm. I. I think I'm. I'm. I can't be a Canadian. I mean, can so yeah, because I'm still adapting and all the other stuff. I'm. I'm. Even though I'm. I'm still have. I don't have the status that to. Even though I can't work uh, legally, I'm just like I'm still applying. So, 
so everything is just like I'm I'm just in the middle of somewhere. But that's make me because before that I just feel that I'm really tired of do the creative. But because of this situation, it it's inspired me something. I want to I want to make a project about it. That's about my my is is it related somehow related to this situation that's in the middle of somewhere. Is <laughs> is quite that's 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 um that's some challenging, I mean, for me as well. So that's, that's my, that's what, what I'm doing right now. Yeah, thanks for sharing that with us. Um, I want, I have like so many more questions I want to ask you, but uh, just to be mindful of the time, um, I guess I'll, yeah, uh, yeah, just to, uh, I would like to just move on to um, Emil, but uh, yeah, maybe we can, I'd love to hear more about that as we move into Q and A, and I'm sure everyone else here would as well. Um, so, um, just taking a look here. Um, yeah. So, with um, all that we've been talking about in Hong Kong, um, I was hoping that Emil, with your the research that you've been doing for many years around. Um, like different marginalized groups and how they've been affected by uh, the Chinese state. If you could give us like sort of widen, um, sort of widen the conversation and talk about your research and and for a little bit as well. So. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. I uh, I do definitely feel like a bit of an academic now because I have all these like prepared remarks and I put together a little, uh, you know, a, a little word doc full of what I wanted to write. And then I come and everyone's having a very nice, relaxed, uh, you know, quite pleasant conversation. And I feel like I'm just going to be a big textbook, just thunk, you know, slapped in the middle of this. But anyways, I'll try to keep it brief and then maybe open up to questions afterwards. Um, so yeah, I was suggested, uh, you know, I, I feel like maybe, what I'm here to do is to put events in Hong Kong in a bit of a broader perspective. Um, specifically, I'd like to suggest that we can better understand what's occurring in Hong Kong if we look at events in other parts of China and at how other groups in China have been uh, subject to state repression. Um, and I'd also like to suggest that our understanding of state repression in Hong Kong and China should be framed in a larger conversation about state repression and colonialism around the world, including here in Canada. Uh, so the first thing I'd like to do is maybe put Hong Kong in comparison to other parts of the People's Republic. Uh, understandably, we view Hong Kong, uh, a former British colony, and now a special administrative region of China as a unique part of the People's Republic. And Jevons went over this in, in his uh, remarks. And Hong Kong is, um, but I also think it's helpful to look at Hong Kong uh, in relation to other parts of China, which are populated by people who are linguistically or culturally or ethnically distinct from the Mandarin speaking Han majority. So I'm thinking of areas like Tibet or Xinjiang or Inner Mongolia. And in these areas under China's constitution, these historically non areas have been granted a limited nominal authority over their own affairs. Uh, this means the uh, people there have the right to preserve and practice their culture and language. They're supposed to have a greater say in the governance of their own territory. Uh, people there are supposed to be partially exempt from stringent birth control policies. And the, uh, the young people there are also supposed to be given preferential treatment um, on the national university exam uh, system. But in practice, this autonomy is often deeply uh, limited. And this is especially the case under the current president, Xi Jinping, um, there's been a greater push to further sinicize these regions, which essentially means encouraging these areas to more resemble the rest of Han-dominated Mandarin-speaking China. So this can include uh, increasing the use of Mandarin Chinese in public schools as opposed to local languages, again, very much in connection with Jevons' uh, film, uh, or tightening controls over religious activities. And such moves, I think, are part of a larger effort by Xi Jinping to deepen party state control over China and create a clear and uncontested vision of national identity, one that's centered on Mandarin speaking Han Chinese culture and loyalty to the Communist Party. So I think the most obvious comparison there is uh, between Hong Kong and another part of China would be with the uh, Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, 
Uh, this is the region that's located to the, in the northwest of China. If you picture a map, it's directly to the north of Tibet. This area is the historical homeland of the Uyghur people, a Turkic, a Turkic ethnic group, along with other largely Muslim groups like the Kazakh and Kyrgyz people. Uh, there have long been complaints in that region uh, by the indigenous people that Han-led rule has relegated them to second-class status in their own land and that the benefits of economic development um, have benefited Han settlers at their expense. And for its part, the Chinese government has for decades looked warily at the ethnic minority uh, Muslim people of Xinjiang, especially the Uyghur, as potential terrorists, as religious radicals or separatists who are intent on splitting Xinjiang from China and undermining the legitimacy of the Chinese state. Uh, and since 2016, when a new party secretary, uh, Chen Chuanguo, took over, we've seen a massive increase in state repression in Xinjiang, targeting the indigenous people there and the Uyghur in particular. The most ex obvious example, which I'm sure many of us are familiar with from reading the news, the most obvious example of deepening repression has been the creation of uh, re-education centers, um, extrajudicial detention centers in the country, or sorry, in the region. Uh, there are different estimates for how many people have been detained there since uh, 2016, 2017. It's probably safe to say that hundreds of thousands have been held there without trial for periods of weeks to months to years, uh, could be many more. People are detained for a, rate, a range of supposed offenses, most of them linked to their ethnic or religious identity. So this can include growing a beard, uh, wearing a hijab, uh, having contact with relatives or communities overseas, or, uh, you know, quote unquote, excessive praying. Uh, we know there's also been a concerted effort to reduce the Uyghur population um, with IUDs and sterilization forced on Uyghur women. There's been a massive drop in births um, in the Uyghur population over the last few years. We've also seen the forcible removal of children from their families, from detained parents, and put into government-run um, uh, daycare centers. And this has also been accompanied by the full or partial destruction of thousands of mosques, graveyards, and other important cultural sites. So I'm not suggesting that these forms of mass repression, detainment, or cultural destruction will be transplanted to Hong Kong. Uh, but what I do think is true that, is that under Xi Jinping, these areas on China's periphery have been seen as potential weak points in his rule. These are areas that are historically connected to a world outside of Beijing's rule. So in Hong Kong, it's the British, uh, Xinjiang, Central Asia, and the broader Islamic world. And in both Xinjiang and Hong Kong, the Chinese government has moved under uh, Xi Jinping's rule, has moved very decisively and brutally, not only to crush overt resistance to the state, but also to weaken the very social foundations out of which a distinct cultural, social, or political identity can flourish, uh, including forms of, of uh, unique governance, say in the case of Hong Kong, or distinct cultural practices. And so in essence, I think what we see in both Hong Kong and Xinjiang, along with other peripheral areas, is a desire to make these culturally distinct areas more closely resemble the rest of mainland China over the, the opposition of the actual, of the indigenous people there. Um, the second point I think uh, I'd like to make is that these forms of repression that we see in places like Xinjiang and Hong Kong are not without precedent. So the Chinese state has a long history of repressing marginalized communities, it uses threats to social stability. Uh, and in order to better understand the character of repression in Hong Kong and Xinjiang, I think it helps to connect those forms of repression in those peripheral areas back to repression that's taking place within China targeting a myriad of groups. Um, so this is specifically what my research focuses on um, in the Department of Political Science, the University of Toronto, and that's how the Chinese government attempts to control, surveil, and detain what it calls key populations. So these are people who the Chinese state view as threats to social stability. And this is an incredibly broad category and includes everyone from users of drugs to people with criminal records, to Falun Gong practitioners, to citizen petitioners who have <clears throat> problems with local government, uh, to even people with uh, mental illnesses. These are people who are targeted for surveillance and detainment across China. They've been targeted for decades, long before the current campaigns in Xinjiang and Hong Kong began. And in fact, many of the forms of control uh, that we see in places like Xinjiang actually have their origins in the policing of these so-called key populations. So if we look at, for example, the, the the detention centers in Xinjiang, which I just mentioned, yes, I think the scale 
Uh, the ferocity of the, the detainment policies there is unique, it's new. Um, but for decades, similar systems have been used to detain members of key populations across China. Um, one example that I focus a lot on in my own work is users of drugs. So to this day, the Chinese government runs hundreds of drug detention centers where people can be held for up to two to three years without trial simply for using an illicit narcotic. So while there, people learn how to be law-abiding citizens, uh, they may be compelled to work for a pittance. And when they're released for up to three years, former detainees are kept on police-run lists of registered users and are subject to scheduled and random drug urine tests. A positive test can mean another stint in detention. And because registration is associated with a person's national ID card, which is a key part of your life in, in, in China, even the act of using your ID card, say to book a hotel room, or purchase a train ticket, or log on at an internet cafe, can trigger a visit from the police and another compulsory urine test. Now these forms of control, whether it be extrajudicial detention, government registration and surveillance, or the looming threat of reincarceration, are widely deployed in Xinjiang, specifically against Muslim minority peoples there, but they're also widely deployed in the rest of China against these key populations. And in fact, many of the systems that we associate with repression in Xinjiang were first developed, say, to deal with these key populations, users of drugs being one. Um, and yet in discussions of state repression in China, I think we, we rarely hear about repression against, say, users of drugs or people convicted of criminal offenses or people with mental illnesses. And I think this is a mistake. Um, I think this is a mistake because the line between crime control and political repression is blurry. It's blurry in many countries, and it's especially blurry in China, where the police and judiciary are obligated to preserve the uncontested rule of the Communist Party. I think it's also notable that political dissidents are often arrested in the name of policing crime. This is the case in Hong Kong. It's also the case in the rest of mainland China. Uh, likewise, the repression of criminalized populations, like users of drugs, is often used by states to bolster the legitimacy, uh, their legitimacy in the eyes of a public who's concerned about law and order. Again, this is the case in China, it's the case in a lot of countries. Um, if the state is, I believe, if the, if the state is using crime control as a cover for political domination, then for researchers or advocates or allies um, in and outside of the country, I think we should concern ourselves both with the repression of these criminalized populations, along with the repression of religious or political minorities. Um, What's more, I think, is that, uh, you know, we, we talk a lot about um, solidarity, uh, understandably, solidarity with uh, the people of Hong Kong, with the people of Xinjiang. Um, but I think we should extend that solidarity to all victims of police and state repression in China, not just those who are targeted for their political beliefs or their ethnic religious identity. So if we grieve for the loss of freedom in Hong Kong or Xinjiang, then we should also recognize that for many in those areas, their freedom was already deeply circumscribed. Uh, the jails and detention centers of Hong Kong, Xinjiang, and China are not just full of political dissidents, like the prisons of Canada. Uh, they're filled with the poor, the vulnerable, the needy. And I think any critique of state repression, you know, it contains within, within it a demand for a more just political order to follow. And I think any future political order um, cannot be predicated on the continuing use of prisons and police control, to control society's most vulnerable. So I think this connects to my final point, which is that when we're looking at events in Hong Kong and Xinjiang and the rest of China, um, we should put them into a, a global perspective. I think, yes, we are rightly appalled by the cruelties of the Chinese state against vulnerable people uh, in, in China, against ethnic and religious minorities in Xinjiang, against the people of Hong Kong. Um, but if we look closely at those systems of state surveillance and repression, uh, I think we might be unnerved to find that there are similar ab abusive practices here at home or in our recent history. And I think to take the most extreme example, you look again at the re-education camps of Xinjiang, and I believe such centers should look, you know, disturbingly familiar to us in Canada. What do these camps resemble if not a 21st century version of the residential school system that the Canadian government used viciously against uh, the indigenous people of this land? So both the residential school system here and the re-education camps in Xinjiang are both, I think, based on or built out of uh, the kind of racist logic of settler colonialism. Um, similarly, I think we can look at the Chinese government's campaign of repression in Xinjiang against Uyghur and other minority um, Muslim population, indigenous 
uh, Muslim populations there. And we could see a clear echo of the West's global war on terror. So again, we understandably, justifiably balk at the Chinese state's repression in Xinjiang in the name of uh, people's war against terrorism, right? But the justifications offered by Beijing are not dissimilar to the ones that Western capitals offered in their wars in Iraq or Afghanistan or in their anti-Muslim uh, policies at home. So again, I think when we're, we're denouncing China's brutal uh, policies in Xinjiang, we have to be willing to denounce or connect those same policies to our own government's complicity in a global war on terror. Um, I'm not bringing up these, these comparisons to engage in kind of spurious whataboutism. I, I do actually believe that a sincere critique of the abuses of the Chinese state, which are real and manifold, I believe that a sincere critique needs to rest on a principled opposition to abuses committed by any government, including our own. And we have to be willing to recognize that the systems of repression and surveillance that we see in Hong Kong, in Xinjiang, in the rest of China, that those systems exist on a, on a spectrum. And that in many cases, the past or present behavior of our own government in Canada or elsewhere are closer to that of the Chinese state than we would care to admit. And I think understanding these similarities is vital if we wish to create the kind of international solidarity needed to resist these abuses wherever they occur. Uh, so I'll leave it there for now, but I'm interested in hearing feedback or questions. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much, Emil. Um, yeah, I guess now I would love to open it up to a Q&A period uh, if folks have any questions for Jevons or for Emil. Thank you again, both of you, for um, taking the time to uh, share your experiences and share your work with us. Um, I'm super excited about this talk. Um, yeah, and if you have any questions, um, feel free to private message me or uh, put the questions in the chat. I already see there are some questions and some thank yous. There's some thank yous. People are just saying, are just excited. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I'll give people a few minutes to formulate some um, questions or comments and um, sort of, and then we can chat more casually. Um, yeah, and I think if, if there's anybody who wants to, you know, just turn on their camera or say hi or ask yeah. in person, that is also um, totally okay too. We just we have the chat option for um, for comfort. <laughs> yeah, Jamily, hi. Hi, um, that was brilliant. Um, really. Um, impressed with um, the analysis that you brought to the conversation and the experience in history. It's, it's really um, very moving for all of us to witness this today and to think about all the issues that are encompassed in this sleepwalking embassy culture house stands with Hong Kong. And I think one of the things that SS Ho and Olivia and Brian have been talking about is that linkage that um, you both have been talking about in terms of the um, the surveillance state and and authoritarian the emergence of, of authoritarian states and the continuity of that authoritarian state from colonial histories and so part of what um, has been brought to the table by our curators is a look at indigenous filmmakers here in Canada um, and accessing that for a um, a broader public within the context of this project. But one of the things that was brought up was the subtitling of these films. And I, I have to return to this idea, particularly because of um, Jevin's film, Dialect, um, where if we were to subtitle indigenous filmmakers here on Turtle Island for um, a larger audience, that might be directed towards a Hong Kong public or a Hong Kong diaspora, what language would be most appropriate for subtitling if these films are made here, either in an indigenous language here or in um, 
part English or Indigenous language or French part Indigenous language or, or whatever context. So the question of language and how that is um, conveyed through the subtitling technique is very, very important in this in this conversation. And um, also, I, I just want to say that like the timing for this conversation as well, given that the Muslim world is going to begin Ramadan tomorrow on April the 12th. So just a reminder there that we, we, we are a secular organization, but of course, we, the premise of the Embassy Culture House has always been issues around human rights and um, speaking in terms of those issues and equity issues and standing for people who are marginalized, both within our own community, whether they're people who are homeless here in the East End of London or, or whether London, Ontario, I'm speaking, or whether Vancouver, East uh, Hastings Street or where, wherever the um, particular uh, situation is happening, where people are experiencing homelessness, which is, you know, given the, the circumstances now that we're all facing the pandemic. So there's a few, you know, um, urgent situations here that this project brings to the fore and challenges all of us within our communities to position ourselves and to be strong advocates in whatever way we possibly can. So we are really grateful. For your presence here today. Thanks so much, Jamili. And I feel, um, well, I don't have as much to say as you. I, I want to echo like my thanks for Emil and Jevons and Brian and Stacy and the fact that they've brought a really rich discussion to London, Ontario to Vancouver um, and I think brought up a number of questions and interesting ideas that I hope the project continues to address. Is there any questions on your end, Stacey? Um. <laughs> well, but I don't I, know, I feel like, yeah, go for it, hi. Yeah. Well, I was just wondering about that point about language. The subtitling? Yeah, the subtitling question. Um, so if we were to, so the idea was um, we have, was if we were to bring um, like a First Nations language or a First Nations film to uh, Hong Kong, um, let's say, and we wanted to um, make sure that we wanted to subtitle it, what would we subtitle it? Uh, what language would it be subtitled in? What language? Um, so I guess, like in the past when I was growing up watching Cantonese films, um, Hong Kong films, it would always be subtitled in traditional Chinese, um, which was used in Hong Kong rather than the simplified Chinese that's used in China, as well as English because of the um, because of the history of British colonialism. So it was always easy for me as a Duxing because I could, I could read the English as well as, as, well as the Chinese. Um, but yeah, what, what about now? I'm not sure. Um, Jevons, do you have any uh, thoughts on that? Uh, actually, uh, right now, I mean, for, for the Hong Kong movie, um, they, they will do the subtitling. But of course, the, the re uh, you, you, you have a, uh, brought up a very good question that um, the the technique of the subtitling uh, always be ignored because um, because the, the the resources I mean the the movie focus uh, because of the resources of the filmmaking is already limited right now for the uh, Hong Kong movie it, uh, of course not the uh, co production with the China but they will have a lot of money but for the Hong Kong movie um, because yeah the the, the investors uh, a lot really want to uh, make a film that is only for Hong Kong people, so the money is very limited. And so the resources for the like uh, post-production and also like the subtitling is um, uh, 
for me, sometimes you have to ask the friends, then can you help me to volunteering to do the, the subtitling? Or, or even sometimes maybe it's the filmmaker himself to do the subtitling. So maybe there there is some mistakes and of course it's not that really good enough because there is not um he's not the language. I mean he's not the he's not focused on the language. And and also um for me as an audience here, uh, I mean I go to different countries and actually I always want to watch the cinema. I like I go to Turkey or Hungary. Or uh, even though I'm in US, I'm in the even though I'm in Canada, but my experience is that even though the because I, I need subtitling for myself, I need to because uh, they will speak a lot of slang that I may not understand. Maybe the subtitling can help me, even though it's written in English, that also help me. But you know, most of the countries they don't provide the even though they because they are English medium. So they, they, they think that it may be not necessary to put the subtitling, the English subtitling on the on the cinema. But, but so it let me always um, hesitate to go to the theater here, I mean, in the uh, overseas, because the, I, I, I'm not really sure, uh, I can't really understand what's the movie about. And so, yeah, it's a very really good question. The subtitling is really important, I mean, uh, for, for our films and for the filmmakers and also for the audience to have a more better understanding for the work, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Stacy, did you get any questions from people who are watching? No, I don't have any questions from the people who are watching, but... <laughs> Uh, I okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. I, I have some on hand, but Tarek, you go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say thank you very much uh, for making all these connections and bringing uh, the situation into uh, in Hong Kong home for all of us, Brian. Really great to hear your kind of witness, uh, bearing witness on the ground of what the situation is like. Um, my uh, observation uh, uh, in these kinds of discussions around what is um, the challenges of kind of authoritarian states and, and practices that kind of grad or expand control or harmonization of the populations for whether it's um, commercial enterprise or, or political policy. Um, it's very difficult to, uh, to, to make these links when they're happening in one country or another, but the trends are, are there. And the practices are kind of, you see them replicate themselves through history. Um, I was just interested to, uh, uh, in terms of the average person and their awareness of kind of these trends, Emil, what, what is your, what have you seen as being a successful way to kind of open people's eyes to these connections? And, and how do you, uh, um, how does the average person do anything about it from your perspective? Because it is kind of an ominous future for, for many people when we look at, at the trends around the world. Um, myself, working in government, I actually look back to culture as a very important way to make bridges and uh, the work that my, my parents have done over the years in terms of making connections ac across uh, let's say political divides and finding the human human angle and connections uh, as a very important way to build bridges. And um, uh, it's a like Michael Coverig was a is a colleague of mine, and so his case is very important. And he was one of the reasons why he was targeted was because of the work that he did do on the Uyghurs. And um, as when he was a diplomat, and then when he went on as a as a um, uh, take a leave of absence to work as a for the international crisis group, and uh, and a lot of these issues when we face it in government is also really how do we how do we uh, use the power that we have in our hands to to do good and make these connections so that people see the impacts of their actions. Sometimes it's not always in their immediate backyard, but around the world in another country. I think. China has done very well in uh, in state capitalism by using prison labor to build highways around the world and bridges and 
and and and these and this is a kind of an innovation on on colonialism in a way is that they their 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 Belt and Road Initiative is very much built on the backs of prison labor, and uh, and that is kind of lowering the bar for for the rest of the world as they see how do you exploit populations to to get the job done or or expand the resource extractions. So, anyways, I'm just curious, Emil, if you've had any in your studies kind of observations on what is the 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 best way to uh, address these issues and get the word out? Uh, I think I, I feel hesitant to offer a, sort of suggestions about what people should do, because I know there's a lot of people who are engaged in activist circles and they have a very a clearer sense than I do of what actually works. Uh, I do think that, you know, um, whether it's the Canadian public or publics elsewhere, there's a kind of instinctive desire not to see other people being harmed. I think it's, you know, if you're looking at the situation in Hong Kong or in Xinjiang, I think it's it's kind of human to see what's going on there and feel a, a degree of sympathy um, and a concern about those developments. Um, I think just going back to what I said before, I feel like there's probably two things that maybe we can do. The first one, which I discussed, was maybe looking at what we're doing here and uh, whether it's treatment of Indigenous people uh, in, on land on which we all live, um, you know, on principled reasons, just looking to actually pay back the massive debt that we have to those, to the, the Indigenous people here. And I think partly that's because it's something we should do anyways, but it's also something that, you know, can demonstrate to whether it be China or other countries that um, there are other ways of dealing with these particular issues outside of like a heavily securitized col um, colonial relationship. Um, I think the other issue is perhaps thinking a bit creatively about what kind of support could be offered to either diasporic communities, again, people from Hong Kong or China or the, um, uh, the Uyghur population here in Canada or elsewhere, um, extending, uh, making it easier for refugees actually to get here, again, from those populations, but just in general. Um, and I suppose the difficulty, of course, is that this requires us to be critical, not just of how we are dealing with these particular issues, but how we think about issues, again, like settler colonialism here or our immigration system or whatnot. Um, I think the, the danger sometimes is of creating kind of categories of kind of worthy or unworthy victims and kind of extending support to a particular class of people, say from Hong Kong or from Xinjiang or from China and inviting them over, um, but uh, excluding or ignoring other groups. Um, so in the case of, of Hong Kong, like I would, I would love to see the Canadian government being a bit more robust and just offering asylum to anyone, regardless of uh, education level, of work history, of criminal record, just if you feel threatened or unsafe, Canada will accept you. But again, I would like to see that extended to people from a variety of countries, um, not just China, but but elsewhere as well. Um, again, maybe that's a bit of a wishy-washy answer, but but my my sense is it's it's kind of a dual prong thing. You have to be cognizant of what we can actually do here to make Canada a more just and humane place for everyone, um, and then also perhaps extend consideration to those diasporic populations but again also to listen to them again i'm not a member of the, any of those those communities so i think um maybe privileging uh the voices of people from those areas and hearing okay what kind of support do they need um and then moving forward thanks for that emil i mean that was i think uh tarek asked like a really difficult uh, question. <laughs> um, and I noticed too, um, Esther, you put your camera on. Was there anything you wanted to ask or talk about? <laughs> Just making sure. Um, have I unmuted? Am I good? Excellent. Um, so this is a question maybe um, for Drivens and for, or Gavin, sorry, and, and maybe Brian. Um, I've been working on a project. Oh, by the way, thank you guys for this amazing afternoon presentation and uh, the beautiful film dialect, Jevons. Um, I got a chance to watch it last night. I watched them all. And uh, wow, it was just, there was so much going on in the films. I've never been to Hong Kong, um, but it really felt, I understood the space 
as a home with people in it fighting external forces and that was really helpful for me in being able to come to this presentation with an understanding of where things were coming from so thank you for that um i've been working on a project about uh, surveillance and anti-surveillance activism and of course in my research it has taken me an awful lot to what's happening right now with students in hong kong and what i'm watching when i see um commentary and documentation and stuff is that it's kind of like a race between the imposition of new forms of surveillance by government agencies, private companies, and the students who are coming up with anti-surveillance technologies and techniques, everything like as simple as the umbrellas and masks to the laser pointers and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then listening to the conversation today, it seemed like it was almost kind of a parallel between the population having to um, keep up with the whims of changing colonial states. Britain, starting with Britain, and then the changes in British rule, changes in British impositions upon uh, the people of Hong Kong, and then to China, and then the whims of China and the impositions. Um, I guess my question is, is does it, wow, it's a really long sort of laundry question. Does it, is that, does it feel like that, that there's this kind of race between advances and resistance uh, and and struggles between understanding new impositions and coming up with solutions to do end runs around those impositions. Does that question make sense? And what, uh, yes, please come comment if you can make sense of what I've said. Mm -hmm. uh, can I you? Can... I'm not I'm really not... understand the question. I mean, do you, what you want is the. Can you, can you? Yes. Um, I guess, I guess to, to, the simplest form of the question is, does it, um, do, do the activisms that are in Hong Kong and also just the general population who may or may not be particularly active, uh, activist, does it, is it reaction? Do people react to impositions or do people try to um, anticipate what is going to be happening and prepare for the next move of either the colonial oppressors or the corporations or the government itself. Mm, okay. Um, actually, from my understanding or observation um, during the, the movement, uh, from my from my point of view, is that um, actually it's all under the government control. Even the even the reaction of the public is all. It's all the it's all the prediction of the government. They want the chaos because they want they are expecting the people to do something violent, for example, and and so they they just trying to make um, make a speech um, and also they they have some spy uh, spy I mean the spy policemen I mean the con they 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 they, they pretend to be a uh, protesters and so um, and they will do something. And so for the for the for the for the normal people, I mean, um, their in their reaction is foreseen by the for actually they 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 just they they just fall uh, seems like they fall into the trap, okay? Their their reaction, and the rea and and also, uh, some of the reaction is like they interact with each other. It's like they we said that is um, they are dividing. I mean. They, they, uh, because people, every people have different idea of what to do and how to do. They have different idea, and so um, they they dividing the the protester, the government using this this actually. So so it's really difficult. I mean, uh, if it is a long term long term prote protesting, from my understanding, and um, just like in the twenty fourteen in Hong Kong, there's the umbrella revolution. It's a um, so that after the 87 day, 80, 80, 80, 80 days, and then, okay, it's finally go to an end without anything because it's the long journey. And at the same time, this also seems to be like that. I mean, right now, this movement. But of course, they will be have an other movement later. But this time, it's, it's come to this, this point of view, this, okay, because of the long, long fight. 
and the government actually will take control. I mean, they have the they have the resources, they have the power, they know they they have the uh dom they can dominate, they can do all they they can speak. I mean, they have the big voices, but all the people they they or e even in the internet they have the platform. Uh, they 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 can share different thoughts, but they can't have the central voice. They can't fight. I I I can say this is difficult to fight back, and and so uh so for for my understanding the protester and the people is always the is always so passive. Actually, we 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 want to be active maybe, but but you you can't because the, but but only only if the if the fight is short one. I mean, for the very beginning, if if you can fight it, you can you can win it, and then you win it. But so that's that's my observation. Yeah. So the, yeah, that's that's it. Do you feel like you're still in that fight right now, uh, even though you've been removed, you're removed from Hong Kong itself? Um. Yeah, but it's it's, it's different. The fight. Mm -hmm. it's, we are, we still keep fighting. Actually, I, I can say that we we keep fighting, but. You, it's not the same, and and you you know that is the, uh, for example, if is that is in in the very beginning of the movement, and every fight you do is very powerful. Just like two million people on the street to protest is very powerful, but uh, so everywhere and and the government it seems they have to listen to the people because they 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 are they are so fragile at that time, but right now. It seems they are using the police force. They are using different kind of stuff. The civilians and the national security law. They put the people in the jail, and and we are so, this time right now we are so fragile now. I mean we we are not protected, and so so what we are doing it seems like we have we 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 have to fight in the in the big giant force right now, and so we have to we have to save. I mean we have to save the energy. I mean to together again, maybe we have to waiting for the next fight. I mean, but not every time we, we have to have a big punch right now, it, it seems this is not the, it's not the, you can't punch it. I mean, if, if that's the, the Kung Fu style, okay. <laughs> okay, so you have to, you have to hit them. You have to waiting, waiting for the, for the, for the, 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 the timing. The best, Patience. Best, best, best. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the spirit of Be Water and the slogan yeah. of the protest. And and given the right time to uh, fight back and defend yourself at the right timing. And I don't see... Um, I think if... if I agree uh, in in certain extent uh, with uh, Jeffens about um, the passive um, state of um, pro protesters, and and talking about the reaction, and I think it's like um, uh, action and reaction pair. So it happens at the same time. So if you if you think the protesters are taking reaction uh, from the government, I think the at the same time, government is also taking reaction from the protesters. And um, uh, if we want to take the, uh, a, pro, a, a proactive approach, then we have to break the, the cycle um, with creativity. So I think um, it is everything everyone in the movement have their own thoughts this is real and that makes um there are like luminous um possibility and creativity that you can input to the movement and maybe this is too optimistic uh to me um, but it is also um a question that raised um in my mind recently, whether Hong Kong people wants to fight back to the totalitarianism, what, whether Hong Kong people want to fight against the Chinese government. So it seems like they are thinking, they are considering. So I'm like, in, in this sense, I'm waiting for the response. I'm waiting for the people to respond. Okay, if 
everyone want to fight back the Chinese, then I will be one of them. That is the, uh, my answer. Thanks so much, Brian and Jevons. That was such like a, a rich and a rich answer. And I think Esther, you asked like the perfect question in terms of like, um, yeah, like how people are reacting, right? Are you predicting? Or are you um, or are you responsive? Um, I think that's a, a really interesting way to sort of um, end the conversation and sort of like leave on that note. And I'll pass it over to Stacy to maybe to wrap up. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's, that's, I think that's a, Brian, thank you. I think that's a really um, thoughtful way to end the conversation. Um, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, maybe we can try unmuting ourselves or un turning our sound back on just to give uh, Emil and Jevons like a hand, a round of applause. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you.